Hi there, I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is part two of a special edition of Rook. This is Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian Obsession, Part 2, coming to you on Instagram, SoundCloud, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and Telegram. Our website where you can see all these episodes together is at rookmedia.com. So here's a little bit of what we heard on Part 1 of this series. A fanatic one. (laughs) <laughs> that's the correct answer you you've proved the <laughs> hypothesis in, in one sentence <laughs> this music is uh, very much attached to the literature for iranians always literature comes first we cannot look at pink floyd post-revolution without looking at it pre-revolution if we consider the wall as the end of their real career the revolution already started in Iran. So we got isolated in the 80s because of many reasons with the Western world. I'm not saying that most Iranians understood uh, the uh, philosophical aspects of their lyrics or anti-establishment taste in, in the lyrics, but, but somehow it, it resonated for, uh, with the people after the revolution in Iran. Our love for uh, progressive music is because of our uh, tendency towards complexity. Some of what you heard on part one of this series. On this episode, we address sonics, class, and connection with Reza Mogadas in Toronto, Amir Bahari in Tehran, and Sepp Osley in London. Here we go. Here's part two of Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession. My first guest for part two of our series is a prolific Toronto-based producer, sound engineer, and musician who over the last three decades has produced, recorded, and mixed over 1,200 albums and singles. Reza Mogadas was born in Tehran in 1972. His professional music career began in 1997, performing in the groundbreaking Iranian fusion band Avi He is an accomplished pianist, bassist, and setar player who has worked with many masters of Persian music, cinema, and theater, including Shajarian, Mohammad Reza Lotfi, Kehan Kalhor, Reza Derakhshani, Gugush, Bahram Bezai, and Kamal Tabrizi, to name a few. Reza moved to Canada in 2005 and is currently venue manager and technical director at the Small World Center, a cultural hub, venue, and studio space. But right now, Reza Mogadas joins me from Toronto. Hello, sir. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> we had to have you in the mix. I'm, I'm very curious to see where you're going to go with this. Listen, we've been exploring the interesting <laughs> intersection of Iranians and Pink Floyd, and you are very well placed to give us some perspective. Let me start by asking you if you remember sure. where or when it was that you first really became aware of Pink Floyd in Iran. Uh, I was grade uh, nine or ten. That's when I, because I started with with Persian, with with, with uh, Western classical music, and my my mom was a big classical music fan, and my father used to listen to like a lot of Persian classical, like Shajarian and Sharam Nazari, and then the only thing like was 
So, so nobody really listened to like any rock and roll at that time when I was a kid, uh, except my mom listened to Beatles. But like when I went to high school, that was a time that I started listening to like okay, pop and rock and heavy metal, and then and then after that, it, jazz. But but that was basically when I was like 13, 12, 13 years so, old. So if I'm doing the math correctly, that's that's by the 80s. That's after Engelob, and that's when there's a yeah. particular crackdown on music. How would you access music, and how would you have found out about Pink Floyd? Is this somebody older than you passing around tapes, or how did you get yeah, it? Yeah, well, that was easy. Uh, that was easy that time because we knew uh, some people that their job was to get the masters from Europe at some point. And then they do like, you know, underground uh, duplication of the cassette tapes at that time. And then uh, we called the guy over the phone and then we met in the street. He was like, we're dealing some drugs. And then, you know, okay, this is this is the latest Uriah Hip album <laughs> or like, you know, Iron Maiden or whatever. And then, you know, we we'll give him some cash and, and there we go. Uh, so we get one, and then, and then, uh, since like you know, my high school time, I was really into audio technology. So I had like a really nice high end double deck uh, set up at my home, so I could like you know do the rest of the job for my friends. <laughs> and, ah, and then here we go. You were one of the dealers. You were one of the <laughs> the music drug dealers. Yeah, drug dealers. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, uh, um, just because you mentioned Europe, um, one of the theories around why certain bands popped in Iran, like became uh, uh, the likes of, for example, not just Pink Floyd, but Masalan Scorpions, is because mm. a lot of the music that was traveling into Iran was via not just Europe, but even more specifically Germany. And yeah. that's why uh, a band like Pink Floyd, which was huge in Germany, would be more likely to get into Iran rather than U2. Does that make sense to you? Well, I don't know because I know a lot of bands they're more popular in Iran than their own country. Like for example, like Chris de Berg or Yanni <laughs> right, or right, right. like you know Modern Talking. Look, so you talk about these guys. Uh, I I know people in Toronto they went to Yanni's concert uh, a couple of years ago at Budweiser. So it's like everybody's talking Farsi there, so it's like, my mad, look at his hair, it's like, you know, okay. Dude, I'm telling you, no one has heard of modern talking except Iranians. No one. Exactly. Okay? Not even Germans have heard of modern talking. <laughs> and then it's, it's, uh, some other bands too, like talking about the band Camel. I was talking to my colleague at Small World that one of my friends, he's now in Toronto, they're going to tour with Colin Boss, the bass player from Camel, uh, in a couple of years, and then they released their album. Ramin said they released their album that the band called Diminished Quartet, you might know them. So, and and then my buddy, he's into music business for three decades. Like, who's Camel? It's like, well, <laughs> yeah. the, the 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 rock band from like you know eighties. Like, I don't know Camel. Like, I've okay. never heard of Camel until these conversations. <laughs> you Iranians yeah. who grew up in Iran going, already get King Kidim Zon, Pink Floyd, <laughs> oh, Camel, yeah. and I'm like, Camel, what's Camel? You know, what's Camel? Never, it's like the Camel. And they're the not animal? even a, they're, yeah, yeah. they're like a British band too. I looked them up, it's and, a British but band. no yeah. one's heard of them except for. So this is, but there's some kind of pipeline, and I wonder if Pink Floyd was part of that. Well, I don't know because because Pink Floyd is is not that kind of band that they sold like you know a couple of million albums. These bands sold about two hundred fifty million albums yes, worldwide, yes. and and seventy five million only in U.S. at the time that the U.S. population was about like two hundred million. So one in every three <laughs> Americans they yeah, have an original yeah, yeah. Pink Floyd album, which which is kind of a record. So it's. If you tell me, like, you know, I, I, I believe, like, Pink Floyd is one of the icons of music of 20th century. It's like, we're talking about classical music. Yeah. We say, okay, Beethoven, Bach, and Mozart. Yeah. And then when we talk about 20th century, we definitely say, like, Miles Davis, Beatles, Pink Floyd, Michael Jackson. So these are, like... These are the icons. You can't talk about music. Sort of, sort of. <laughs> yeah. I think no, no, no. Here's the here's the problem. Here's the problem. Here's where you're because I sense now that you're a naysayer that you don't agree with this hypothesis that Pink Floyd was disproportionately or is disproportionately um, uh, popular amongst Iranians, those in Iran yep. and in the diaspora. And that, here, here's the thing for anyone in the West of uh, people around our age or, any, or younger that you're you'd say who's the greatest rock bands of all time? You'd immediately say Beatles and Stones. 
right? And you might yep. say you might say the Who, you might say Led Zeppelin. Pink Floyd's in the mix, but but there's no chance that Pink Floyd is okay. going to top the list all the time. Whereas, how many Iranian friends do I have that I've spoken to in their twenties, thirties, forties, fifties who would lead the conversation with, "Oh, I loved Exile on Main Street. I love some girls. I love the Stones." No one talks about the Rolling Stones. They talk about Pink Floyd, and I know why. Okay. I know the, the, okay. the reason. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, Tell because, me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. There are a couple of reasons. So one of the, one of the reasons I think. Uh, Pink Floyd. Okay, let, let let me tell my my uh, perspective about like you know my my idea about Pink Floyd. Okay. Pink Floyd is one of those bands that their technique is hidden in their production. So unlike a lot of these bands that we talk, like you know uh, King Crimson, uh, The Who, and then later on like Yes, Rush, whatever. Pink Floyd is not that progressive. They used only five chords to compose their entire music character. True. There's so simplicity the structure there. Yeah. Of, exactly. The structure of the songs are so simple that you can easily remember. You listen to one song and it just stays in your mind the whole rest of your life. It's not that you have to count the groove and the, the, all their songs are in 4-4 four, four or slow rock except Money which is in 7-4. And the other thing is, what I realized when I was younger and I used to listen to rock music with family and relatives and cousins and parents, something that they don't like, Iranians don't like, didn't like at that time, is the distortion sound of guitar. So Pink Floyd has this pleasant, charming sound of the guitar, not the uh, Hendrix or younger Eric Clapton from Townsend, Time. Pete Townsend. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah Pete yeah. Townsend. So not that kind of distortion. Whenever I played those kind of music in like family gatherings and all my aunts and uncles and cousins are like, it's just, it just sounds like vacuum cleaner. It's not music. It's like, Thank okay. You. See, now we're getting somewhere because this explains a lot. Because even for, I mean, because when even when people start talking about, well, because they were rebellious and they were anti-authority and anti-establishment, and I was like, well, so are the Clash. But I don't hear a lot of Iranians being into the Clash or the Sex Pistols or, or you know. Yeah, so when yeah. you talk about the sonics of what exactly. appeals to the, um, but why is that? Why is the Iranian ear more tender than, you know those who would be listening to British punk or distorted chords uh, of well, classic it's, it's, rock it's, bands. It's, it's 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 cultural because we did not grow up with that thing. We didn't have you. You listen to Persian rock bands at that time, like uh, Ojubaha and Scorpios. Not Scorpion. Scorpio. I was a famous rock band, Iranian rock band back in the day in seventies. Or, or like you know, the younger version of Black Cats back then, yeah. which they played rock and roll, they, or Kuroshi Agmai, they all used clean tone Fender guitars without any distortion. So this is cultural. We didn't have any rock and roll bands in schools. We had, uh, you know, classical ensembles. We had folk ensembles. We had pop stuff before revolution, and we had choir. But we didn't have anybody going on stage playing like, you know, Zeppelin stuff, <laughs> except these three bands. But they, this, they, they, they kept their tone cleaner than Western. So when you grow up and you don't listen to that music, uh, you don't get it. And, and in, in our pop music production, still up to now, people are hesitating to use that much distortion like i don't know that many iranian like heavy metal bands that they use a lot of you know overdrive well so, i was gonna so, actually that that was the one flag on the play on your theory because this is so interesting to me because we you know no one's has, has brought this up yet in terms of that the sound and of course i would give it to you to to bring this up that make it, it makes so much sense but then why is metallica huge in iran I metallica's mean, Okay, Metallica's favorite songs are those soft songs. <laughs> yeah, like those slow <laughs> songs. 
not 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 like you know not like enter sandman that was like you know uh unforgiven or that was that's a song or or yeah one of those like slow songs got so popular and and and, and something else metallica is popular between the generation after me like 80s and 90s people that they they you talk to people from 90s and after they don't know pink floyd yes at all. they do yes they do that's well, I, I, you're absolutely they don't know pink floyd here i mean you have to be over the age of 35 or 40 in the west i think to really you know unless you're particularly into that kind of music but i've found exactly. in my extremely unscientific survey of course of iranians <laughs> but you know 20 somethings 30 somethings 40 somethings they know floyd and they they even know some songs like they can they can recite them back to you in a way that they wouldn't be able yep. to with the beatles which is you know the, mm. the holy grail for people in the west who grew up right you know okay so but but i see like young young kids coming to me to produce their music and and then those people that I see in their like mid twenties, they have no idea about Pink Floyd. Okay. Like maybe they're different okay. different levels of the people coming to Canada or like in Iran, but different, you know, um, economical or, or or social level. But like when you talk to people, you realize that that it's not that popular. That was between us and people in sixties and fifties. So so that type. So so this is one thing. Like Sonic thing is one of the main points of that and then simplicity as we talk a lot i mean the first time i bought my electric bass i was in in high school and the first song i started playing with that was comfortably numb because mm -hmm. it's the same pattern repeating for five and a half minutes right. and 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 still i'm teaching to the younger kids i start with that song because they can play with that song and enjoy so it's kind of I don't want to use this word, but that might sound like Pink Floyd is more of an easy listening music. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, well, you're, you're certainly, I mean, first of all, we should distinguish, as you know, between the <laughs> uh, the eras of Pink Floyd. If anybody who's a super fan is listening to us, they they think that we're sort of I idiots for not mentioning that th there's, an, there's a pre sort of early 70s Pink Floyd, the Sid Barrett years of Pink Floyd, that yeah. is certainly not easy listening. I mean, that is a, Gama, Gama, a very or, challenging listening, yeah. in fact, and that's sort of psychedelic... In, in fact, distorted at times, very heavy, yes. you know, <laughs> uh, very difficult to follow, um, very visceral music. And then there's this 70s period, which you're absolutely right. Actually, I mean, I think part of the reason why Pink Floyd, my theory would be, and in, 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 part of the reason Pink Floyd becomes a stoner band, you know, a band that you know, me growing up in high school in the West, um, <laughs> my, you know, the older kids who were in the Pink Floyd and, you know, um, from and remembered them from the 70s. And when I was, when I was just learning about it, they they were stoners you know they were people who they were they were into drug culture and that's because it's our room it's a little bit like you know you yeah, you close yeah. your eyes you take a you know you you you, you know you, you take a haul on the joint you, you know you or you, <laughs> you drop whatever you're going to drop and you experience the music <laughs> and so you're right that is yes. it's not you know it's not necessarily this heavy rock thing exactly and and the other thing which i believe it's it's also an important note is the lyrics for Iranians is like really easy to communicate and learn and relate because uh, when they're talking about war, we I mean, I experienced eight years of war in my life. So I know all these issues with the war. And then Pink Floyd is one of those bands that like talking exactly about war. Mm -hmm. uh, but education system we grew up in like a terrible education system so this is like but when you listen to the lyrics from like Beatles if you're not from that culture you can't really communicate and understand what's happening right. and then Pink Floyd didn't really do political until like yeah, Animals was political but it was like kind of kind of <laughs> under skin late 70s until yeah, like yeah. The, the wall and Final Cut which in Final Cut, they started like naming people like Thatcher, yes. uh, Reagan, yes. and Berzhenov. And those names were like so popular in Iran because you open up the uh, radio or TV during the war between Iran and Iraq. Every day you hear all those three names. 
But so Reza, you, but Reza, I mean, I, I don't want to uh, repeat myself too much. I brought this up with somebody else. But you too had an album called War, had a song called Sunday Bloody Sunday. I mean, if you were to, if you're just talking about lyrics and angst-ridden, you know, anti-establishment and uh, you know, fighting against oppression or, or what, mm. however, you would say, here's the band. Here's the, you know, let me let me play you this and uh, to the Iranian youth of the 1980s, and it would resonate. I don't I don't hear Iranians going crazy for you too. At least those coming no. out of that era so so what's the difference well the other thing is the uh we go back to the sonic thing like uh one other thing that i realized that iranian people ordinary regular non-professional in music people they they don't like is the high-pitched voices (laughs) So so so, so yeah, many particularities. Like, because, yeah, <laughs> you, you you listen to all the pop uh, uh, celebrities like you know Daryush and Siavash Komeshi and Satar and none of them really screams on the microphone like <laughs> Jimmy Page, uh, Robert Plant, you know, and, and 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 that's something that Pink Floyd is like. These two guys are singing with their relaxed voice, and even if they get angry and they shout, it's like male kind of loud okay let me tell you this story you you <laughs> might hear that but it might be interesting yes please a uh, couple of years ago i had a really nice chat with the great bob ezrin yes. so i met him at canadian music great week guy. and he had a lovely pa- guy pa- yeah, yeah. panel discussion and after that i saw him like wandering around so i picked up his brain and then we had a coffee and then we talked so, uh, you know, he, he talked about all the stuff at Canadian Music Week, let, which let, is let, me, let me just uh, explain to people. Bob <laughs> Ezrin, super producer, uh, happens to be Canadian, lives in Vegas, but, but also the producer of The Wall. In fact, the conceptual exactly. conceptual producer of The Wall as well. But go ahead, yes. So, uh, and then I was like, okay, so I, I, I heard what you said. I read a lot about you. I, I listened to all your interviews. But one thing that whenever I meet all these celebrity producers, I ask them, what is your day like with Pink Floyd in studio? Like one day with Pink Floyd in studio? Because that's something that I do every day with different people and different bands and celebrities and artists. So I want to see how you manage your day with Pink Floyd in studio. And he was like, during my 50 years career, Pink Floyd is the only band that they used to work 9 to 5 in studio. <laughs> so they show up at 9 a.m. with their charts written in their suitcases. We start the recording process whatever whatever and then we get a break for lunch and then if they finish by five they finish if not they leave the job for the next day and and i think that affects their their character people relate and communicate with these people like you know i follow uh david gilmore on instagram i feel it's like he's he can be my uncle <laughs> you know he's he's that kind of cool and you talk to iranian they know their lifestyle they know about yes. roger waters they know about their breakup they know about like yes and that's it and then these guys are like you know recycling their own material for like three and a half decades I, I personally, I think I have five different masters of Dark Side of the Moon, and I know there are like two other versions that I don't have. And, and, so, by, and by the way, they're not, you know, I mean, in terms of, you know, being the voice of the unwashed masses or something, these, these guys are elites. I mean, they live in castles. Like, they're, yeah. they're very wealthy, older, elder, you know, um, knighted British men, right? Well, two to three hundred million dollars is like their net worth, each of them. So I think Roger Waters has more than David Gilmore. He has about 300 million and David Gilmore has like 200 million. But even like, you know, at age of 50, uh, 75 with like $200 million, what do you want to do? They're like richer than a lot of Hollywood celebrities, yes. more than like, you know, Al Pacino or Robert De Niro. They have less than them. So uh, I think that that's one thing. Their characters is like so easy to communicate. You And then their shows are... More of the uh, you know all those lights and stage designs. It's like a it's like a show. And I remember like a lot of people in my generation. We used to pass the uh, the VHS tapes from from the, the concerts and like the way even the old Pompeii show and then up to the latest one. Their design and then the stage, their visual effect. It really captures people. Not a lot of bands they do that like in that time. And still, like, still they're far from other bands in production. So, 
So I want to ask you about something that I find really interesting and somewhat surprising as an element to discuss when it comes to Floyd and, and Iranians, and that is there being a class dimension. Uh, there, there's this notion suggested that that there was some sort of sophistication to listening to Pink Floyd, which is, uh, you, you could sort of test that theory uh, to a certain extent, but especially in Iranian circles, it was seen that way. And that, that's partly because of this class dimension, where even playing or listening to rock music, especially in the era of the 1980s and 90s in Iran, was something somewhat elite. In other words, that rock music was only about and for those who could afford, who could access the instruments, afford them, uh, even access the music. And I guess what's interesting about that is that that's the very inverse of the romance of rock and roll in the West, which is that exactly. it could be a working class exploit where bands like the Sex Pistols or Guns N' Roses or, I don't know, the, the Go-Go's exactly. would come from the streets or, <laughs> or what you would see in hip hop with the emergence of bands like Public Enemy or NWA who were literally from the street. And that in Iran, there was a prohibitive cost to playing in this game that would make that come from below almost impossible in that era. Does that resonate for you? Yes, so so let me tell you some of the great experiences with Pink Floyd music. Uh, our dear, dear, dear friend Arash Mitui, son of Sima Bina, yes. he's probably the one who did the greatest copy uh, or cover uh, concert of Pink Floyd. And then, so he he had like yeah he had a the first recording studio I saw in my life. It was his home studio that used to record his mom and his own albums he's a couple of years older than me but that's where i started learning all this process and then he put a band together well with sharam sharboff from from oham he was on a keyboard and a core keyboard and he sequenced entire dark side of the moon <laughs> electronic and keyboard parts in that thing and then they played a show in uh in in, in, a, in a parking space under a condo, like a low-rise, in Shahrakh Garb in Tehran in 1994, wow. five, okay. sometimes like that. And Mahmoud Kalori, the famous uh, 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 DOP and cinematographer, he shot that show, and it was like 150 people. They put uh, curtains around the parking, turned it into a, a venue, and that was like... Because, by the way, that, this would be illegal, right? This would be illegal. Right. We had people walking on the uh, uh, in the street and then make sure like nobody gets in. If you see a police car or comité or sepa, you just run in and say, hey, stop, like, because he's... But, but, but that was something, you're right, because at that time, you needed to have a lot of money to buy those stuff, even like... The first electric bass I bought, I bought it from Bandar Anzali. Because I had a friend, I was, I was studying in, in, in Lahijan, in north of Iran, near Caspian Sea. And I had a friend who called me, it's like, hey, you're looking for a guitar with four strings? Look at that bass. Okay, there's a store here, he sells a Russian one. And I got into a bus and then went there for an hour and a half. And I saw that and I paid the guy in cash. And then I got it, then I came out, it was almost evening, so no boss, I had to get a cab. Nobody wanted to give me a ride with that instrument. It's like, you can't get into a cab with an instrument. I was like, hmm. guy, this is not an AK-47, this is, this, this, is, right. this is a goddamn right. instrument. And I want to get it to my home so I can plug it into my little, little speaker and play. So that was the situation back in the day. Place we lived when we were young in a world of magnets and miracles. Our thoughts trade constantly and without boundary. The ring of the division bell had begun. Right now, things are totally changed. Right now, there's so many great, great, great bands from poor neighborhoods from working people working class and from like south part of Tehran they got into the music but, but it explains why for a certain generations um, mm -hmm. be, it, be it Gen X or the Millennials or whatever that rock music or Floyd or whatever it is would, would be associated with the higher class would, would be associated exactly. with sophistication somehow 
Yeah, so that's what I'm saying when, when Bob Erzin said, like, they showed up at the studio dressed up uh, in their <laughs> mid-30s with their suitcase and then charts in there. So you see that unlike a lot of rock bands that you see their acts on the stage and then, like, you know, they're breaking their guitars or, like, they're putting fire on the stage or, like, their makeup, like, Kiss or Marilyn Manson, they were just a bunch of gentlemen on stage, <laughs> like, you know, really nice dress up and then playing beautiful music that we can we can enjoy. What do you think, Reza, what do you think the impact of Pink Floyd, uh, the, uh, the popularity of Floyd, the widespread um, uh, um, listening of, of Floyd in, in Iran through those years, what do you think the impact has been on Iranian musicians? It was a lot. I mean, I know a lot of musicians, a lot of musicians that they only listen to Pink Floyd for like a decade, nothing else. And you can hear that in their compositions and in their music. Uh, a lot of guitar players that I know grew up in Iran, they started like playing guitar. The first song they played, just playing a riff from Pink Floyd. Hmm. As I said, I started playing bass with Pink Floyd. Uh, not a lot of keyboard players into Pink Floyd because that's where their technique is there. Like, you know, their production techniques, you don't want to get there because that was the most complicated thing that they right, did at that time. Right, right. Still, you want to do that now with all this technology. It's it's kind of hard. But I think that's thing, like like a lot of great, great guitar players that I know, like Anush Sabuktakin, Arash Mitui, they're all like played Pink Floyd for yeah. most of their life. Yeah. And and you see that influence, that technique. Like, you don't need to be a guitar hero like, you know, Steve Ray Vaughan or like, you know, Jimi Hendrix or like all those, you know, uh, guitar heroes in 80s playing those metal bands Van to Halen. be able, Van Halen, yeah, to play a beautiful song. You can just play a note and hold it for two bars and just give it that that effect to, to, to run. And as I said, make that guitar tone charming. And even even David Gilmour invented some of his own f effects because at that time it, they didn't exist. So so he had to go into a lab and then, you know, build what he needs. And then now we know, I think, Face Shifter and one of the digital delays, it's like he's the one who, who, who made it originally. So that had a lot of lot of influence on the the, the people on my generation that they <laughs> they are now great guitar players. Well, let me ask you a final question as a musician, um, yeah. and uh, I, I, you get the chance to geek out and be a, a fan here, if if in fact you are one. But it occurs to me as a <laughs> bass player when you talk about um, Pink Floyd being where you started to, to a certain extent, uh, and I'm, I was saying this to Dara Dara um, Yeah, you know, P Roger Waters because he said I started playing bass because because of Roger Waters. And I, and I said, you know, he's, this guy's not exactly, you know, Stanley Clark. I mean, he's not even Tony <laughs> Levin, right? He's not like, he's, he, I mean, to the outsider, I mean, I'm not a, um, I, I played bass as a teenager a little bit, but I'm a guitarist, but I, I you know, I, I, I look at Roger Waters and go, yeah, good bass player. What, um, what made, or what makes, uh, he's still with us, what makes Roger Waters so special as a bass player? Well, one thing that I strongly believe in music, and you can hear it in my music too, is the the pattern, the creativity on pattern and melody and licks and groove. Like like this, these are the stuff that you can hear. As you said, you don't need to be like you know Stanley Clark, Victor Wooten, John Patitucci to be a bass player. You can. What I what I say that that said that I, I teach my students because they can lay down a groove, enjoy the rhythm, and repeat it over and over. And and this music be, be becomes becomes like a ritual, becomes like a psychedelic ritual because you repeat that melody yes. and repeat that pattern. And those patterns are beautiful. Those patterns are simple. I know some of the some of the recordings that were too complicated that David Gilmour played the bass line in, in Animal That's album. right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he played those fretless basses, but but what Roger Waters plays is like, you know, it's not that com. It's like same as, uh, you know, Sting or same as uh, a lot of these, these bass players who play and sing, they really don't play complicated patterns, but they play a groove, a pattern that, yes. that is the is the main like you listen to a lot of Pink Floyd songs 
when I want to r- listen to the song, the first thing comes into my mind is like, oh, the bass line. Exactly, like exactly. I, it may be simple, but it's 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 usually the mo- it's melodic. Signature of the song. It's, exactly, it's usually the signature. It's it's the melodic <laughs> underpinning of the song. Yeah, m- much more so than you know a Beatles song. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of like you know, and then and then you can hear the notes because they play two three notes per bar. It's not it's not a lot of notes. And then as I said, the the compositions are simple, like four chords verse and three chords chorus and then they repeat over and over and then solo over the verse and solo over the chorus and that's the song so it's nothing too complicated which you can learn it so fast and and i realized when you learn a song so fast then you can play with that then you enjoy that than me having to look at the chart my entire like you know (laughs) rehearsal or practice or like jamming you can just you know learn the four chords and then and then just you know jam on that and enjoy it (laughs) Reza Mogadas, uh, predictably, <laughs> yeah. predictably, you were amazing on this. I, I, Thank I you, man. so enjoy talking to you. Thank you for this. I hope to see thanks. you soon and keep rocking the Floyd. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. <laughs> enjoy your day. Thanks for the interview. It was amazing. Bye, brother. Merci. Okay, have a good day. Enjoy your day. Bye. The lunatic is on the grass. The lunatic is on the grass Remembering games and daisy chains and laughs Got to keep the loonies on the path The lunatic is in the hall The lunatics are in my home The paper holds their folded faces to the floor And every day the paper boy brings more You are listening to part two of a Rook special series, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession. Coming to you on SoundCloud, Instagram, Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and Telegram. Also, for all the episodes in one place, you can go to our website, rookmedia.com, R-O-Q-E media.com. My next guest is a well-known Iranian music journalist, critic, and author. Amir Bahari was born in 1980 in Tehran. He began his career writing for Iran newspapers in the 1990s as a film critic. Then, given that he also has a passion for music, he began to write album and concert reviews. By 2010, Amir had become one of the most prominent music journalists in Iran. He has been a writer and editor with publications such as Farhangi Ar- Ashti, Golestani Iran, Etemad, and Tehran Emruz, where he's written about Persian rock, metal, and blues. And Amir has also been a major contributor to many music projects, radio programs, and documentaries. He is one of the pioneers of writing about rock music in Iranian media. And right now, Amir Bahari joins me from Tehran. Hello, sir. Salam, man. Salam, as kam khidmat shoma va mukhtaban podcast rock. Merci, خیلی خوشحال هستیم که it's so good to have you on this program. Thank you for doing this. Uh, I really am grateful to have you as part of the mix on this special because I can only imagine, Amir, that this question around Pink Floyd is something that you have either pondered or discussed before. So let me get straight to the meat of the matter with you. Why do you think Pink Floyd has connected with Iranians so much so in the last few decades? من فکر می کنم که یه مقداریش به اون فضای به خصوص بعد از انقلاب اسلامی برمیگرده که توی ایران ما با یک سری محدودیت ها در زمین موسیقی مواجه شدیم عملا 20 سال تمام موسیقی تقریبا ممنوع بود به خصوص موسیقی پاپ و توی این مقطع هست که به شکل زیرزمینی مردم دارن یک سری کاست به هم دیگه میدن و کمتر صفحه و توی این مقطع پینک فلوید خیلی مطرح و مهم میشه در ایران و نکته جالبش اینه که خب این بحث ها قبلا هم مطرح شده که 
آهنگ دوال دقیقا در بهبهه آغاز جنگ ایران با عراق آلبوم دوال منتشر میشه و خب این حس در واقع اعتراضی به مزاق ایرانی ها خیلی خوش میاد اما جدای از اون و جدای از در واقع بحثی که مطرح شده باز هم پیشتر که خب خیلی شانسی هم بوده که حالا چون خیلی از گروه های پاپیلارتر از پینک فلویت هیچ وقت ایران شهرتی نداشتن اما اگر بخوام اینجا بحثم رو تموم کنم یک سری هنرمند هم بودن که در دهه شهست خیلی پنهانی در حال نواختن گیتار الکتریک و آموزش دادن این ساز بودن که زائقه اونها خیلی گرایش داشت به نوازنده های مثل دیوید گیلمور و موسیقی های مثل پینک فلوید و اون آدم ها هم بی تأثیر نبودن در این که شاگردانشون این تفکر که این گروه گروه خوبی هست رو اشاره بدن و این سینه به سینه به اصطلاح ما ایرانی ها یا در واقع دهن به دهن به چرخه و پینک فلوید گروه محبوبی بشه I love it. Though there's, you've made three points there. Uh, let me take them one at a time uh, because they invite further questioning. The first one being that that cassettes were passed down, and this is the question of access to after after nineteen, essentially after you were born, <laughs> after after nineteen seventy nine, the revolution. Uh, the the way people I understand are are hearing uh, uh, music and rock music, pop music, and pop culture. In fact, is what remained from the seventies being passed down by older brothers and sisters and fathers. and mothers, etc. What's curious to me, Amir, and what you must have some sense of as a, as a music journalist and a rock music journalist, is why, it, it, why was it the cassettes of Pink Floyd rather than, I mean, as you know, sitting here in the West, for example, in North America, it, it, it would be Pink Floyd, but it would also be the Rolling Stones. It would also be The Who. It would also be, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin. Why Pink Floyd rather than, say, The stones. من فکر م... خب سوال خیلی جالبیه من فکر میکنم که ببین اول من یه نکته رو بگم ما در در واقع دو دهه پیش از انقلاب یعنی 1960 و 1970 در این دو دهه بیتلز و رولینگ سونز و دهو در ایران مطرح هستن حداقل اخباری راجبشون ترجمه و منتشر میشه okay. به خصوص بیتلز که حتی مجله اطلاع جوانان باهاش مصاحبه هم کرده در دهه چهل حدود سال 1965-6 اما جالب اینه که توی این دو دهه پیش از انقلاب ما حداقل من ترجمه یا خبری درباره پینک فلوید نشیدم حتی در سالی که دارک ساید آف مون منتشر میشه یعنی ما مجله‌ای داریم اوایل دهه 1970 تا 1973 تا 1975 پیش از انقلاب به اسم تاپ 20 که آهنگ‌های معروف روز رو میاره ترجمه میکنه okay. حتی فرهاد هم جای اشتباه کرده که من از روی این ترجمه ها و چون به انگلیسی هم متن رو چاپ میکنه ترجمهش رو هم چاپ میکنه میگم فرهاد هم اشاره کرد که من از روی اینها میخوندم یه ترانه هایی رو اونجا همه خیلی ها هستن من اگه بخوام کلی بگم از بیتلز هست انیمالز هست حتی ریر برد هست مودی بلوز هست حتی دیدورز هست و توی اما پینک فلوید من ندیدم اونجا یعنی تا پیش از انقلاب پینک فلوید موجودیت نداره در فرهنگ ایران بجز برای یه خواص حتی من اگر بخوام فکت دقیق تر به شما بدم من با اعضای گروه اسکورپیو که یکی از معدود بیت بند های ایرانی راک بند های ایرانی بودن که تا خود انقلاب کاور می زدن و هیچ وقت فارسی نخوندن خود این گروه یک بار مسیح محقق یکی از گیتاریست هاشون به من گفتش که ما اپیتاف رو به سختی کاور کردیم اپیتاف کینکرینسون رو یک بار هم بیژن علی محمدی گیتاریست دیگه گروه که الان انگلیسه و توی نیوکاسل اصای دانشگاه بوده بازنشسته است بیژن علی محمدی میگفتش که ما 
جنسیس کاور کردیم و خیلی خوب بود و ما نمیخواستیم فارسی بخونیم چون داشتیم موسیقی که کاور میکردیم پیچیده و جذاب بود ولی هیچ کدوم از این آدم ها به پینک فلوید اشاره نکردن به بازخانی پینک فلوید و علاقه به پینک فلوید در پیش از انقلاب ولی یک مرتبه بعد از انقلاب همه این گروه ها میرن کنار و این پینک فلویده که خیلی محبوبه و شناخته میشه یک از دلایلش به نظر من اون اندوه و حزنیه که برای ایرانی ها داره آرامشیه که پینک فلوی در ایرانی ها داره دوستان من پیشتر از عبارت سهل و ممتنه علی بوستان یک بار در یک مصاحبه ای از سهل و ممتنه بودن موسیقی پینک فلوی یعنی در این حال که پیچیده است ولی در این حال ملموس حداقل با اون آرامش شرقی ما ایرانی ها همخونی داره خیلی از ملودی های پینک فلوی کار پینک فلوی خیلی مقدمه طولانی داره ما اصلا اساسا پیش درآمد در موسیقی خود ما مسئله جدیه که حالا تا بریم برسیم حتی در موسیقی پاپیولار دهه 1950 ما 1960 ما معمولا ترانه های حتی پاپیولار مقدمه های طولانی دارن و ذهن یعنی من همطور دارم سعی میکنم که تلقی خودم رو بگم شو. انگار ذهن مخاطب ایرانی با این در واقع آرامش و عمقی که پینگ فلوید داره همخونه ولی مثلا اون در این حال پیچیدگیش براش ملموسه ولی مثلا یس رو یا مثلا جنسیس رو نمیتونه هضم کنه شاید به خاطر اینکه اون سویه در واقع شعر سخت انگلیسی که حالا مثلا یس داره آقای صدیقی قبلا راجع به این صحبت کرد رامین صدیقی yes. شاید اینها هست ولی من ورای همه اینها ما در دهه شست فرهاد مجذوب کوروش یغمایی خانواده یغمایی ها اینها کسایی هستن که گیتار آموزش میدن و این آدم ها علاقه خاصی به این گروه ها به کمل پینک فلوید گروه های حتی عجیب بریبی که اصلا تو کشور خودشون شاید مخاطب نداشته باشند الوی جین گروه های آلمانی و علاقه این آدم ها به نظر من در محبوبیت این گروه ها بی تاثیر نبوده Uh, by the way, Amir, as a side, you know, doing these interviews on this journey to discovering what the connective tissue is between Iranians and Pink Floyd, the biggest revelation to me, and I say this as a musician, I say this as a music producer, I say this as somebody who's worked in and out of music and as a music critic for many, many years, I'd never fucking heard of Camel. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea who Camel is. And, and all these Iranians are like, Camel, King Krimzon, camel and i'm like what the what is camel it's so interesting so interesting that yeah. this, this is the But, this is where different worlds collide and and certain things get into the culture and certain things don't there you, you mentioned the second point you meant you you said in your initial answer was what well, you talked about the wall and there is a theory that um you know the wall came out in 1979 november 30th 1979 it's it's right in the middle of the revolution and that somehow because the wall came out at that time and then the nature of the lyrics and the anti-authoritarianism and anti-oppression, anti-government lyrics, and then, of course, Roger Waters' political stances in the years following, that this would become the thing that Iranian youth would um, clench onto, that would separate Pink Floyd from other bands of the era. Do you think there is credit to that theory? بله بله من فکر میکنم که اتفاقا این دوال خیلی آلبوم مهمیه چون حالا من شخصا آلبوم دوال رو به لحاظ آرتیستی و موسیقی خیلی دوست ندارم و به نظرم جز کار خوب پینک فلوید نیست ولی خب دوال منهای حالا ترک کانفتر نام ولی اون آهنگ انادر بریکین دوال با ماها که تو دهه شهست تو مدرسه ها از معلم ها اون داشتیم کتک میخوردیم خیلی ملموس بود برای ما که ما آموزش شما رو نمیخوانم اما چیزی که تو انادر برکین دیوال داره خونده میشه Leave them 
اما من یه چیز دیگر رو هم میخوام عد کنم بهش اینکه ما ایرانی ها معمولا دوگانه ایم یعنی وقتی مثلا اگر بخوام از فرهنگ کالت ایران صحبت کنم دو تا تیم فوتبال هست به اسم پرسپولیس و استقلال sure. که هر کسی در ایران یا طرفدار اینه <تصفيق> یا طرفدار اونه right. و راجر واترز و دیوید گیلمور جدا شدن از پینک فلوید اینو این ب... تا مدت ها بحث های خیلی طولانی بود حتی من بین اسم نمیبرم بین موزیسین های شناخته شده دیدم که سر این بحث کردن و کار به جای باری کشیده شده من میخوام میگم این دوگانم بی تاثیر نبوده چون ایرانیا دوست دارن اینکه در واقع تو مثلا شجریان رو بیشتر دوست داری یا شهرام ناظری رو آه. من طرف ابی هم داریوش خوب نیست من طرف داریوش هم ابی خوب نیست اینا چیزایی که تو فرهنگ ما وجود داره That's so interesting. And of course, the, the people who are the Roger Waters fans don't accept the albums that came in the, uh, after 1983 and, and uh, you know, the 1994 album. They, they, they don't accept those as Pink Floyd records, right? Uh, it's, it's not acceptable. Um, you, you, the third thing you talked about is the nature of the music. And I want to ask you this question because I've asked a few people this. In fact, uh, Dara Dara E just gave a really interesting answer to this. But why, why it is, from your perspective, that progressive rock, I mean, these are just very general terms that, you know, it, it's not really fair to these bands to put them all in the same category. But you've mentioned a few of them. Yes, Genesis from the 70s, at least Genesis, before they became more pop. Uh, uh, Pink Floyd, they fall into this category of progressive rock, which seems to be much more um, resonant for Iranians than the kind of class, what we would call classic rock, which would fall more in the, the category of Boston and the Who and uh, Zeppelin and the Stones, etc. What What is it about progressive rock that has been so important to Iranians? Even to today, I'll meet Iranians, young Iranians, and somebody in their 30s who won't really know the back catalog of some massive band like U2, but will know King Crimson. I mean, that for somebody growing up in the West is very strange, you know? So how do you explain that? ببینید من بر اساس تجربه شخصی میگم من اولین ترانه های راکی که شنیدم و دنبال کردم یه تکاهنگایی بود از گری مور از مثلا کمی بعدترش از سوپر ترامپ و بعد مثلا گانزن روزه از متالیکا و یه باری که دوستام که حالا خیلی از من بیشتر موسیقی گوش کرده بود و من گفت از اینا گوش میدی پروگرسیو راک گوش نمیدی یعنی در یه موضعی که مثلا پروگرسیو راک یک موسیقی پیچیده و عجیب تره و اینا مثلا راک های خیلی ساده استانداردن و از همونجا برای من این سوال پیش اومد که پس پروگرسیو راک چیه چه فرقی با راک داره و وقتی شروع کردم به گوش کردن این برام جالب شد که خب مثلا این کل یک قطعه امکان داره بر مبنای آکورد پیش نره حتی آکوردا امکان داره عوض بشن ملودی در واقع اون پلی ریتم برای بر خود شخص من جالب بود ولی جدای از این جذابیت های موسیقایی این که یک کلاس اجتماعی متفاوتی بود یعنی انگار شما ببینید در ایران تا یک مقطع تا همین اواخر کسی چندان به این توجه نمی کرد که آقا پینگ فلوید دیویست میلیون نسخه آلبوم فروخته و این یعنی که یکی از بزرگترین گروه های پاپه همه فکر میکنن این یک گروهیه که گوش دادن بهش جست روشنفکری داره ولی مثلا گوش کردن به بیتلز جست روشنفکری نداره مثلا گوش کردن با مثلا هیچ ادراکی از مثلا باب دیلن به این اندازه وجود نداشته که خب اگر به یعنی میدونی این چیزی بود که خیلی جالب بود برای من من فکر من خب حالا موزیک پروگرسیو را یک موزیکی که با پاپ فرق داره اینا تو پاپ کالچر جایی نداره اینا آرتیست های به خصوص یعنی ولی خب هیچ کس هم به ما نمیگفت دوست عزیز همین که شما تو ایران دارین با چند هزار کیلومتر فاصله 
یه گروهی رو گوش میدین یعنی اینکه پروموشن های خوبی براش اتفاق افتاده تبلیغات خوبی براش اتفاق افتاده right. که شما هم اینجا صداشو شنیدین such a good point such a good point yeah it's such a good point can i just add to it too that there is an argument to be made that the beatles are extremely sophisticated music in fact there's an argument to be made that the beach boys pet sounds era beach boys is very sophisticated music now the, the, and the funny thing too that you you raise a really good point that no one has brought up yet which is that pink floyd you know because they didn't have i mean not with notwithstanding the, the 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 wall and another brick in the wall which was a big hit song um you know they didn't really have pop hits so they they are on some level considered this kind of alternative band but you're absolutely right they've sold millions of records they're a big industry and in fact even the idea that pink floyd god love them i'm a fan but even the idea that pink floyd and roger waters are fighting for the working man and the underclass and the revolutionary youth these guys live in castles you know like they're they've almost been knighted <laughs> by the queen they're rich they're you know they're elites you know they even grew up as elites so it's very um it's very funny you know that uh that there's this idea about pink floyd and and now that also makes sense that that that's partly what people are trading on in, in iran they're these are the guys who are speaking about us somehow because uh, um مسائل تضاد های خیلی عجیبی که در این زمینه وجود داره اینه که موسیقی راک موسیقی به نسبت طبقه کارگری و در واقع کف جامعه بوده موسیقی بوده که هر کسی میتونه یه سازی بخره و شروع کنه به ساز زدن ولی گیتار الکتریک هیچ وقت در ایران ساز ارزانی نبوده یعنی در ایران به خصوص بعد از انقلاب گیتار الکتریک هیچ وقت ساز ارزونی نبوده و در نتیجه طبقه اجتماعی و اقتصادی متوسط به بالا میتونسته این ساز رو داشته باشه so و, و این در عدم مقبولیت موسیقی راک با تمام تلاشی که موسیسین های راک در ایران کردن این تاثیر داره به خاطر اینکه اونا اون رنجی که یک آدم تو طبقه کارگر تجربه کرده و این ساز رو دستش گرفته اونا اغلبشون تجربه نکردن اونا موسیقی راک رو دوست داشتن و به خاطر اینکه خانواده طبقه متوسط داشتن و این موسیقی براشون تهیهش کار به نسبت دیگران آسوده تری بوده با از این موسیقی تغذیه کردن یعنی میدونید اون موسیقی راک و بلوزی که طبقه پایین جامعه در مثلا امریکا انگلیس اینا گوش میکردن اون موسیقی در ایران یک چیز دیگری بوده مسئله ای که به خیلی به خود حالا محبوبیت پینک فلوی تو اینا رپ داره و یه خورده پیچیده میکنه مثلا That is such a brilliant point again no one has brought that up that is and i i really hadn't thought about that that actually um rock music Uh, because of the very nature of the culture post-revolution and the suppression of it, that e- that for those to those who could even enjoy or play or learn rock music would have to be elite enough to be able to access, to be able to get an electric guitar, to be able to buy amplifiers, to be able to access the music. That is such an interesting insight because it's the inverse of the image of rock. And in fact, it's the inverse of the reality. If you think about one of your favorite bands when you were growing up, Guns N' Roses, those guys actually came from the streets of L.A. They were, you know, they weren't, they're not rich kids. They're, you know, right. and, and so right. you're, what you're saying is that could not have happened in Iran in the 80s and 90s. Yes? بله بله اصلا اینطور نبود یعنی اصلا شما اگر که چون من به خاطر اینکه تو این سالها با بچه ها مصاحبه های زیادی کردم شما تقریبا نوازنده گیتاری در ایران پیدا نمی کنید که از طبقه ضعیف جامعه باشه به خاطر اینکه اون آدم اصلا گیتار نمیتونسته پیدا کنه یعنی انقدر سخت بوده پیدا کردن یک گیتار الکتریک به خصوص در دهه 80 و 90 میلادی منظورمه 
که این عملا یک چیزیه که مختص به طبقه به خصوص من انقدر تجربه هایی در این باره داشتم مثلا توی مهمونی اومدم گفتم که آقا این آهنگ هم گوش بدید بعد مثلا سلطانز آف سوینگ دایر سریت رو گذاشتم و خیلی آهنگ پاپیولار خوشحال به من گفتن با این, این, با این موزیک های روشن فکری میخوایی ما برخصیم مثلا بیدونی یه چیزی که روشن فکری دایر سریت نه واقعا یعنی این اون طبقه مواجهش با دایر استیت مواجهش حتی با بیتلز حتی با بسیاری از این موزیک ها یک همچین چیزیه اون طبقه چیزی رو که حالا اکسپت بکنه نهایتا دی جی ها دی جی مثلا چه میدونم دی جی یا مثلا چه میدونم خواننده های مثل مثلا لیدی گاگا اینا رو به عنوان خواننده پاپ قبول میکنه که حالا اونجا هم پاپ هستن yes. یعنی یه مقدار شما به اون برتر فکر میکنن که دارید چیز عجیب قریب رو بهشون ارائه میده حالا منظورم زمانهای قبل سر الان خیلی بهتر شده یعنی میخوام بگم اون دورانی که پینک فلوید داره اینجا شهرت پیدا میکنه داره بین یک طبقه الیتی شهرت پیدا میکنه که یک طبقه ضعیفتر یعنی یک طبقه متوسط طبقه الیت که یک طبقه ضعیفتر داره با نگاه به این فکر میکنه که اگر بیاد بگه من پینک فلوید گوش میدم یک کار شیکی کرده یک کار مثلا در واقع فرهنگی کرده yeah, yeah. و این مسئله که در مورد خود موسیقی راک ایران ولی این اتفاق نمیفته یعنی اون آدم هیچ وقت نمیپذیره که راک ایرانی گوش بده so interesting and you wouldn't it wouldn't be the case here that you would go I've read Shakespeare I'm familiar with Picasso's artworks and I listen to Pink Floyd that wouldn't you wouldn't think of them as elite activities <laughs> <laughs> you know the way you um let me the i mean john it is so interesting to talk to you i'm going to ask you two more questions because i i'd be remiss if i didn't ask you these questions since you have such interesting insights uh the first question being that uh there there's something else another theory that has come out um through these conversations we've been having about pink floyd uh and and this one let me tell you that growing up in the west growing up in england and canada for me now i'm a little young for for the 1970s Pink Floyd and all that. But by the time I had heard of Pink Floyd as a kid in the 1980s and the 90s, in high school, Pink Floyd for me was very much associated with drug culture. You know, it was uh, it was something that you did drugs and you listened to Floyd and a lot of the, the kids who were like really into drugs were also into Pink Floyd. Nothing nothing bad about that. That was just the, the thing, you know. Um, Arash Sopani, who is uh, coming up in part three of this series, he has a theory that he believes that that drug culture, especially in the 1970s, was quite fervent in Iran. And that's where Pink Floyd gained a lot of attention for Iranians. It came out of the drug culture there. And that's why the older brothers and sisters could pass down Pink Floyd tapes. Uh, and, and in fact, a, the underground drug culture that would continue in Iran would also have an affection for Pink Floyd. Do you think that, um, in your opinion, is there any connection between the drug culture and the connection for Iranians with uh, Pink Floyd? من خیلی موافق این ایده نیستم ولی مخالف هم نیستم چون خب یادمه که خب ما خودمون وقتی پینک فلوید گوش میکردیم چه کارهایی میکردیم فراموش نکردم ولی این کاری نبود که ما با پینک فلوید فقط بکنیم یعنی منظورم اینه که این اون واقعا من ده شست خب خیلی ده شست شمسی منظورم ده هشتاد خب خیلی کوچیک بودم نمیدونم اون نسل چه کردن با این موسیقی ولی من یه نکته ای رو به شما بگم در فرهنگ ده هفتاد ده هفتاد میلادی در ایران پیش از انقلاب کلوب یعنی دانسینگ که میرفتن و آهنگای کاور مثلا پر سایمون انگار فانکل میشنیدن میرفتن مثلا کاور کلیف شد در واقع کلیف ریچارز میشنیدن یا کاور ریچارز میشنیدن توی اون کلوب ها چیزی که خیلی سرو می شده چای و کک بوده و مشروب در نهایت شامپاین سرو می شده و دراگی در کار نبوده 
یعنی اون طبقه متوسط و به بالا حداقل به لحاظ فرهنگی به واسطه یه تصویری که مواد مخدر و مشروب از کاباره درست شده یعنی تصویری که کاباره ساخته بوده از این مسئله مثلا همه میرفتن شکوفه نو که محوش ببینن بعد هایده ببینن و یه عرق مفصلی بخورن بعد از اون طرف ما توی موسیقی سنتی ایرانی این اتهام رو همیشه از دهه 1940 تا 1970 داشتیم که اینا تریاکی هن معتاد به مورفین هن و برای کسی که اون مقطع راش گراک گوش میده اون دیسیپلین و جست این که من مواد اونطوری مصرف نمی کنم ولی و میرم به جای اینکه کاباره شکوفن و عرق زیاد بخورم میرم سینما درایوین یه چای میخورم و یه شامی میخورم و چهار تا قطعه از ری چارز و اینها میشنوم من ارت... یعنی شاید بعد از انقلاب این کانسپت به وجود اومده باشه ولی ریشه تازه ای داره چون پیش از انقلاب بسیار موسیقی راک در ایران فرهنگ متفاوت و بدون دراگی داشته حالا اگرم چهار نفر توش موادی می زدن اون استثناء بوده واقعا اینطور نبوده شما ماشاءالله موزیسیانه که از اون نسل هم زنده موندن وقتی الان میبینین ماشاءالله همه سرحالن و سرپان و سالمن و, و خیلی متفاوتن از اون تصویری که ما از راکستار ها داریم So interesting. So interesting. A final question to you, Amir. There's another theory as well that a few people have talked about, which is that um, Pink Floyd music connects with Iranians because it sounds sad. And, you know, certainly Dark Side of the Moon is not a an album you put on if you're happy because you just finished your latest exam or something, you know, unless you want to get really high and you know, <laughs> escape into it or something. So uh, and, and this raises the question of, of this legacy of melancholy music in Iran and, uh, you know, sad kind of lyrics, sad uh, melodies, and that, that somehow Pink Floyd is is part of that the attraction is that it it sounds like it's it's a part and parcel of our tradition of of kind of sad music do you agree with that من تا حدودی با این فرضیه موافقم به خاطر اینکه خب ببینید ما همیشه تو ایران ما دو قطبی داشتیم یعنی در واقع مثلا سعی میکردن همین الانش هم بچه هایی که را کار میکنن هی میخوان بگن که ما با پاپیا نیستیم یعنی هی میخوان خودشون رو تفکیک کنن حتی گروه هایی که پرترفتارن و سالن های بزرگ کنسرت میذارن هی میخوان بگن که ما ما به اون از اونها متفاوت از مین استریم پاپ ایران فرق داریم right. پیش از انقلاب هم چیزه که مهمترین جایی که تفاوت داشته با موسیقی پاپ و موسیقی ایرانی بوده موسیقی ردیف دستگاهی بوده موسیقی بوده که در واقع خیلی هر بیش از 80 90 ساله که متهم میشه به اندوهگین بودن و محزون بودن و اینها و اون در واقع بکراند اجتماع شاید خیلی آگاهانه اتفاق نیفتاده ولی اون مخاطبی که پاپ گوش نمی کرده خیلی شاید این موسیقی رو گوش میکرد به خصوص در حوالی انقلاب به خاطر کارهایی که حسین علیزاده محمد ازا شجریان و محمد ازا لطفی و پرویز ایمشکاتیان کردن و اون مخاطب پذیرایی پینک فلوید براش شاید راحت تره به نسبت یک ترانه پاپ یعنی اون ساید عادت شنیداریش به داه محور بودن اون موسیقی و قطعات آروم و طولانی با این موسیقی به لحاظ فرمال به خصوص منظورم پینک فلویده ها منظورم مثلا حتی جنسیسی یا یس اینا نیست به خصوص پینک فلویده و به خاطر همین اون فرم موسیقی و با توجه به اینکه موسیقی ایرانی هم فراز و فروت های خاص خودش رو داره بسیار موسیقی که در واقع طولانی بربره مخاطب عادی واقعا سخت گوش کردنش این رو من میشه راجبش بحث کرد خیلی مطمئن نیستم ولی ردش هم نمی کنم. Ari John, uh, it was so interesting for me. Your insights are excellent. I hope I get to talk to you again soon. Thank you for this and uh, merci. 
خیلی ممنونم مرسی که این فرصت رو در اختیار من گذاشتین خیلی گفه دوست داشتنی بود ایشالا که موفق باشید مرسی خداحافظ خداحافظ Listening to part two of a rock special series, Why Pink Floyd, an Iranian obsession, coming to you on Spotify, iTunes, SoundCloud, Instagram, YouTube, and Telegram. Also, for all our episodes in one place, our website is rookmedia.com. Our final guest on this part two is a founding member of the London, England based rock band Blurred Vision. In 2010 in Toronto, musical brothers Sepp and Saul Osley released a cover version of Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall Part 2, but with the lyrics, Hey Ayatollah, leave those kids alone. Its music video quickly went viral on YouTube. The remake was also publicly endorsed by Pink Floyd's Roger Waters. Following the success of Hey Ayatollah, the brothers founded Blurred Vision. The group released their debut album, Organized Insanity, in April 2015. Their second studio album, Redemption, was released on the 5th of June of this year. And songwriter and frontman of Blurred Vision, Sepp Osley, joins me from London right now. Hello, sir. Good evening, sir. <laughs> or I should say uh, good afternoon over there. <laughs> Who knows what time it is, wherever we are. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you, and, uh, and you're lucky to be in my hometown there in London. Uh, thanks for doing this, Seb. Oh, thank you for having me, man. It's good to be here. So uh, let me start with, I mean, I'm obviously going to get to Hey Ayatollah and, and how that uh, all came about, but let me just start with you're a rock musician. You're also a kid who grew up in Iran. Tell me about what Pink Floyd meant to you as a as a young player and songwriter. It meant the world. I mean, my my, my fr- although I should say, you know, I left Iran at such a young age as as so many of us did, you know, it was I think I was about 3 years old when we got out of there and the the, the war was carrying on and or at least just coming to an end. Um so I had the sort of pleasure of having the culture the background of what it meant to be persian you know running through our blood but also growing up here in the west inspired of course most heavily by the music of 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 brit rock uh and certainly none more so than than what pink floyd did for me um and i think it just stuck with me i mean how i began was seeing a concert of them when i was 13 on on the telly and it came on and there was david gilmore playing the solo to shine on you crazy diamond and i just thought to myself hmm. that's what i want to do <laughs> i mean you you're kind of you're kind of young for you know you're i would have thought that especially given that you mostly grew up in the west you're you know you'd be into if you're into brit rock it would be the brit rock of the of the 90s the oasis blur how is it that pink floyd got into your consciousness um well certainly I guess growing up with Saul, who was my older brother, uh, played a big part in that. So a lot of that music, and you're right, in the 90s when I started looking into what music meant, you know, it was Justin Bieber, or not Justin Bieber, (laughs) it was Britney Spears. Yeah, right, it's gone into the psyche. Uh, It was, you know, Britney Spears and uh, NSYNC and Backstreet Boys was coming out, and it was just on the back end of Nirvana and... Soundgarden and Pearl Jam and so I should have most likely gone into that but I think it's because of the upbringing I had with the older brother who introduced me to so much of that classic rock realm of of England from Genesis to uh, the Floyd to uh, the Beatles the Stones and and all of these the the gods that that we all love and I think that's what sort of led me in that direction 
and I'm so thankful for it. Um, definitely made me the musician that I am today. Let me come back to how Pink Floyd uh, have had an impact on you as a musician. Uh, let's get this out of the way because, I mean, it's it's a huge part of not only your trajectory, but but germane to what this special is about. Y- y- you made international news with this viral hit when you did your version of Another Brick in the Wall to support the protesters in Iran. This is back in 2010. Tell me about the decision to choose that song and Floyd music. Uh, it, believe it or not, it happened really naturally. Um, we were playing a show, and of course, we were intertwined with what was happening on the streets of Tehran and all around Iran as we watched those horrific scenes. And it was really the first time that our generation here was seeing something happen in real time on social media. I mean, those kids, what the youth of Iran did, they, they began it all. It, it, Arab Spring and everything we have now with the power of using our phones to spread awareness it all began i think in that moment with with the youth of iran well said you know i i remember we we were up on stage and and we were doing a cover of another brick um of course knowing the of, of how important the music of pink floyd is for iranians um but i just decided to sing hey ayatollah leave those kids alone instead of teacher um and the crowd went crazy and right then i think a couple of days later i was in the car with Saul, and i said look this could be the thing that we do to keep the voice of the young people of Iran going and spread it out to, you know, populations that may not hear of what's happening over there. Because that's all we need to do is make sure that people are watching at, of these heroic things that the youth of Iran were doing. We don't need no education. No dark sarcasm in the classroom Always leaving kids alone Just another brick in the wall All in all, you're just another brick in the wall And that's how it all began, and I think that's, that's basically how Pink Floyd kicked off our journey into the music world. Um, and who knew that after that it would bring in our great god himself, Roger Waters. Yeah, so. I, want, I want to get to that. But, you know, it was only 10 years ago. Um, and yet, yeah. uh, socially and, and in terms of technology and, and social media and the internet, virality wasn't as much the norm then as it as it can be today. Um, how, how did you guys react when this this little protest song that you're doing, using Pink Floyd music, becomes this international... Uh, sensation or or something that people are talking about around the world it was it was such a weird feeling because when it kicked off when it began that morning when we woke up and we were hearing that yeah this video is going viral and it all sort of started and the phone calls started coming in from media um it was like it was a quick snowball the 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 effect was you know you drop a pebble into the into the pond and that turns into a, a hurricane that for us became the, the norm and we started having a reactionary process to everything that was going on and mainly the the video itself was being celebrated as an artistic piece so that took us in the direction that actually is what brought us to london um and we started doing a lot of the interviews here and and getting the word out but you're right it was that sense of having something go viral online it hadn't happened yet and i heard just a little while ago that a professor in, in Germany uh, was using Hey Ayatollah as a, a case point in, in his class for his students to, to sh- basically make the argument that that was the moment where we went from television as a source of news right. to social media as a source of news. Wow. You're a cultural, you're a historical turning point. You're like Princess Diana. 
<laughs> you you do as you um, alluded to a moment ago. You subsequently meet Roger Waters, who also sanctions your use of his song, which would be enough for a lifetime for some people. But the fact that uh, you actually met him, uh, and, and I guess maybe even talked about the song, tell me what that experience was like. Oh, how do you, how do you sum that one up? You know, you, you you wake up and you have a message in from one of the people that inspired you to become an artist in musically, uh, socially, spiritually, in every way you can think. And there is this note from from Roger that's gone out to the world of of his support for us. And and really, we knew that he was backing it, but it was in that moment when he went public with it um, because he was being asked from so many different sides. You know, what what's your reaction to to what these two brothers have done? And he came out publicly with it, and I think that's when it all just really kicked off. And it lifted us up, too, because we knew that it was almost this moment where Roger had put us up on this pedestal and said, all right, lads, you want to take the song? Let's see what you can do with it now. You know, hmm. talk about, here's, here's your platform to talk about what's going on around the world and what's going on in your homeland. And I remember we were in London, and we were just going into BBC GMT, which is the main BBC news show program in the morning. And the producer turned around just before we went on and he said, right, just want you to know that there's 75 million people watching you guys right now and the White House and the Obama administration are interested in what you guys have to say as they've been following <laughs> your story. Uh, wow. You could have until after the interview to let us know. <laughs> Give us a little bit of lead time to be relaxed in the whole thing. But, I mean, it was it was crazy. And yeah, to get Roger's backing and support behind us, it meant the world to us, gave us strength. So, okay, so you're a, a perfect person for this, for the big question of this special, which is, I mean, uh, you're of Iranian background, You, uh, albeit you spent uh, very little time there as a kid, but uh, you've spent time in Iran, you're a musician, um, you're a Pink Floyd fan, and you're known for a, covering a, <laughs> for a viral hit with a Pink Floyd song. Um, what what is it that you have learned about why Pink Floyd has had such appeal in Iran and amongst Iranians? I think the subject matter of of the Floyd is something that connects with people in in in, in a way that is very I don't know it transcends your your personal being. Uh, and connects you with so many others around the world that perhaps are going through the same things you are or the hardships that you are. I think that international, that universal scope that Roger used to express himself in the music, it connects with Iranians because those melodies connect with Iranians. Those words connect with Iranians. They mean something to them because they can, without even knowing what the words are, somehow feel like they're connected to this timeless piece of music and you can see it all over the world i mean whether it be in south america whether it be in europe it's how people react to the fact that the, the music is so personal and yet has an effect on everything they live through whether it's political suffering oppression social oppression they can they can use that as this means to sort of express themselves and release all of that tension within them and, and pink floyd has always been this great shining beacon of hope i think for those of us around the world that have seen hardship so you think the lyrics are are a big part of this the sort of rebellious the anti-establishment the um the anti-oppression uh lyrics that, that predate the wall too uh, uh are are a big part of of what iranians are resonating with one of the biggest parts yeah um of course, you put that on top of a bed of melody and harmony and rhythm that, that the Floyd did that was just, you know, it goes to your core and you can really feel uh, everything they were trying to do because it was always pushing the boundaries of what was out there. It was never really following any trends. They were making their own entire universe of sound. But those melodies also are so embodied into, I guess, that feeling of being Persian and growing up. You heard your, your parents playing it, your uncles playing it, your older siblings playing it. Um, and those melodies rang true with us. And of course, the wall, I think, was the biggest aspect because that was when the revolution happened. Right. And that, that sound remained with us. 
because it meant so much to all of us. So, Sepp, as a musician, what, what would you say, how would you say Pink Floyd has influenced you um, musically? That's a hard, uh, hard thing to, to think about. Uh, musically, I guess, in their melodies, in their grandiose themes, in um, presenting music in the most epic of light, uh, whether it be visually, um, sonically, pushing the boundaries to get something that hasn't been done before. I think musically that could be the greatest influence that, that the Floyd have had on me. Um, you ever heard of a band called Camel? I have, yeah. Oh, I was hoping yeah. I was hoping you hadn't because their name came up in a previous interview on this uh, of uh, you know the progressive rock bands that were popular in Iran and uh, and it was like King Crimson, yes, Pink Floyd, and, and then uh, Camel. I was like, what? What's Camel? I've never heard of Camel. <laughs> <laughs> it's apparently this British progressive rock band that also resonated in Iran that I literally as a musician and a musicologist and a music producer for the last, you know, for decades, I've never, I don't, I don't believe I've ever heard of Camel. You know, their, their music is as intricate as it gets incredible sonic landscapes that they can paint. Oh. Um, very cool band. I'm going to cool have band. to spend some time, some intimate time with Camel, with Shotor, the band. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so if it doesn't sound quite as poetic when you call them Shotor, does it? There's something that just doesn't go uh, away. So a final question to you. I, I, and I mean, it's a, such a great opportunity to speak to you because this, this show is about the Iranians and the diaspora and also the connective tissue we have with Iranians in Iran at, at times and the, the connective tissue we have with each other um tell me about uh as a final question back to the viral hit you had and the hit being related to taking a pink floyd song and 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 using it to uh, express and 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 speak to issues in iran and the youth of iran who were so involved in such passionate protests with the green movement uh the previous year at that time what did you learn about um I'm sure you heard from people around the world, Iranians around the world, and from uh, inside Iran, and I'm sure you still do. What what did that teach you about um, the Iranians of this era? Their bravery, their willingness to put everything on the line for attaining something that we take so, you know, flippantly as we grew up here in the West, something that we expect to happen on a daily basis. I was in awe of the youth of Iran when we were doing Hey Ayatollah. Every morning I would wake up and I would think, how are these guys going out there into the streets, risking their lives and fighting against such a heinous brutality and still doing it with song and unity and creativeness and ingenuity and they it, they were a constant inspiration and that hasn't stopped that without a doubt hasn't stopped for me I, I always turn to the youth of Iran as this great beacon of hope for what what the world can become when that horrible regime is removed and hopefully one day it will be to for us to be able to shine the spotlight on our homeland and show the world what the nation of Iran and the great history of the Persian lands means. And I hope that day comes, and I hope it comes without as much bloodshed as we've seen over the past decades. I hope. Sepp Osley, I, uh, I've got to say, I, I've very much enjoyed this. It's it's great talking to you, um, and I, uh, I really appreciate your insights, appreciate the work you do, and can't wait to see you in person sometime. Me as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Good office. Into the distance, ribbon of black, stretched to the point of no turning back. Flight of fancy on a windswept field, standing alone, my senses reel. Fatal attraction is holding me fast. Well, 
This is full time for part two of our special series, Why Pink Floyd? This part was dealing with Sonic's class and connection. On part three, we address drugs, access, and melancholy. Remember, you can find all four parts of this series on our website, rookmedia.com, where you can also find all of our other episodes. Subscribe and become a patron to support us. Thank you so much for listening to us. Thank you for sharing our content. And thank you to the amazing Rook team working on this. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Mizunbashi. Across the clouds I see my shadow